I don't think I need to explain what Pokemon is, right? But I do think I should explain my history with Pokemon so you get an accurate picture of how deep into Pokemon this is going to go, which is not very deep. I was like seven when Pokemon Red and Blue came out, but we didn't have a Game Boy, so I didn't play it. I think we got a 64 for Christmas 1999, and we got Pokemon Stadium. And Pokemon Stadium had that little thing that you could plug in the Game Boy game into and play it in Pokemon Stadium. And I think I played like 10 minutes of Pokemon Yellow, because why would you play Pokemon Yellow when you could play Link to the Past over and over and over and over again? But I did play the mini games. Like, those were awesome. I played those so much. Here's my ranking of the mini games. Leave a comment below if you agree this is the correct answer. And I also played the hell out of Pokemon Snap. Pokemon Snap was like a great game. You're just on a track. It's very simple. You're taking pictures of Pokemon. I was worried that with the new Pokemon Snap, they were going to remove the track element and you were going to have to like explore And I was like, no, that will ruin the game. Don't do that. And they didn't. And it's great. 10 out of 10 games still. Uh, so <laughs> that's how much I know about Pokemon. It's fine. I like it. I like to watch people talk about it the same way I like to watch people talk about Star Wars, even though like I don't care that much about Star Wars. I'm just happy people are excited about things. I watch a lot of Candy Eevee's YouTube channel. That's where most of my Pokemon knowledge comes from. So if you're watching this video and you're like, hmm, I think I know more about Pokemon than she does, you're probably right. This is a physics video. We're going to talk about Pokemon, but like we're going to do physics. So there you go. It wasn't clickbait. Pokemon evolution, like physically, it doesn't make sense. So in the game and the show, uh, Pokemon Evolution looks like this. Like you start with an initial Pokemon, flash of light, you have a new Pokemon. And usually that Pokemon is more massive and stronger and like a better fighter or whatever. I'm definitely not the first person to point out that that is not evolution. Like evolution is a slow process that happens over a million years and it doesn't happen to a specific member of a species. It happens over like family lines, like genes changing as you move forward in time. Like you can't evolve yourself, right? Evolution in Pokemon is a lot more like metamorphosis. Like you have a caterpillar and he turns into a butterfly, right? But the thing is that I've actually read the literature on caterpillars and I know that they eat and eat and eat and eat and they bulk up and they get real big and then they do their metamorphosis, right? The butterfly comes out smaller than the initial caterpillar because metamorphosis change is a very energetically expensive thing. You can't just take a caterpillar and turn it into a butterfly. The caterpillar has to eat all the food, and then it has to build the cocoon, and then it has to turn to goo, and then it has to remake itself into a butterfly. That costs energy, which is why they do all the eating. Think about bears. Bears don't do metamorphosis, but they hibernate, right? You have fat bear week, they eat all the food, they go into the cave and they like sleep a lot, they lower their heart rate, they rest for the winter months, and they come out smaller because they expended all that energy hanging out and being alive. You can't just suddenly weigh 200 kilograms more. Unless you're in Pokemon somehow. I happen to have a Pokemon right here. This is Eevee, okay? Eevee has a bunch of Eeveelutions. And you start with your Eevee, there's a flash of light, and you're thinking like, okay, this Eevee is gonna turn into something like this, a Flareon. I know things. So if Big Eevee, like Flash of Light, Evolution, turns into this smaller little guy, that's okay with me. That makes sense. Like you had some mass in here, some of that mass went to the change, some of that mass went to the Flash of Light, and now you have a little guy. But that's not actually what happens. What actually happens is you have a little tiny Eevee like this, even smaller. Oh my gosh. And Flash of Light, she turns into this big honking thing. Jolteon. Yeah. This is bigger. Where did all this mass come from? The, the evolution is almost instantaneous. Where, where does this mass come from? How did you make this? How do you go from this to this? I know, I know, it's just a game. 
This one's even bigger. Look at that guy. Look at that guy. How are you turning into this? I realize that Evie's not a great example because you have to get a special stone to make her evolve into Letheon. And so, like, maybe that stone is just like 1,700,000 million calories and she eats it and that's what happens. That's where the energy is stored and that's what turns her into this. But most, most of them don't do that, right? Squirtle is just vibing with his sunglasses on and he's weighing 20 pounds and then all of a sudden flash of light, he's War Turtle and he weighs 50 pounds. How? Where does that energy come from? Let's, let's try to figure it out. Let's get to the bottom of it. Let's make this work, okay? So I'm gonna do just an example evolution to, to work through this problem. And I wanna do Munchlax evolving into Snorlax because I just found out Munchlax existed. Obviously I know Snorlax existed because he's in Pokemon Snap. So throw an apple at him and get out of the way. But also he's so cute, look at him. <laughs> but also, also Munchlax weighs 105 kilograms and Snorlax comes in at 460 kilograms, which is huge comparatively. How do you go from 105 to 460 nearly instantaneously. That 355 kilograms has to come from somewhere. Uh, plus you would need energy to like convert whatever you're doing into Snorlax. But let's spherical cow this problem. But let's spherical cow this problem and make it as simple as possible and say Munchlax like Snorlax, like all animals, is made mostly of water. Let's say we need to find 355 kilograms of water to shove into Munchlax to make it evolve into Snorlax. Where do you get 355 kilograms of water? So you might think there's water in the atmosphere. Just grab it from the atmosphere. No. The atmosphere is like 4% by mass water. You, you can't get 355 kilograms of water out of the atmosphere unless you're pulling it from like the country. So no, but you know, you could say that, well, there's probably hydrogen, there's probably oxygen in the atmosphere. You could just make water, just pull it together. It'll do water. It's going to be fine. And like, actually, no, let's look at a plot. Okay. Here's a plot. It's over my face, right? On the X axis is the altitude in kilometers. And on the Y axis is the volume fraction of different elements. So near the ground, you've got about 20% O2 and 80% N2. Our whole atmosphere is nitrogen. We're doing first order approximations. You can just assume the atmosphere is nitrogen. However, I do think it's interesting that if in like the second between like Munchlax being Munchlax, Flash of Light, Snorlax, like if during the Flash of Light, Munchlax jumps up like a thousand kilometers, he could grab a bunch of hydrogen and then on his way down, grab a bunch of oxygen. And if it was close enough together, it would make water and you could do that. But I don't think that's the answer because surely we would see them jumping in the show. So that's probably not what's happening, um, but it might work. Instead, I think we're gonna have to take the nitrogen that is surrounding Munchlax and turn it into water so that we can take Munchlax and give him 355 kilograms of water to make him a 460 kilogram Snorlax. That's a thing you can do, right? You can take nitrogen and turn it into water, probably. Let's do it. So you might think stars, stars do fusion, right? They, they take small elements and squish them together to make bigger elements. Surely we could take some nitrogen and through some formula, squish it together and make something bigger like oxygen. And then we would just grab a hydrogen and make some water, which is H2O. I don't know if I've said that again in this video. That's water. That's what we're trying to make two hydrogens and an oxygen. And well, that is how stars work, right? Stars are big balls of gas in hydrostatic equilibrium-ish. Like that means they're trying to stay the same radius. 
and you have this huge ball of mass pushing down, gravity is pushing down, and at the core, you have fusion happening, which is taking like two hydrogen atoms and mushing them together and making a helium, which causes a bunch of energy to come out. So you have this radiation pressure pushing out, gravity pushing in, and they're equal. These two arrows are the same size, so your star is happy and spherical. I think that's the thing that confuses people. Like, why should taking two hydrogens and squishing them together make energy? And that's because of Einstein's mass energy equivalence, right? Two hydrogens that are separate have this much mass, but when you squish them together to make a helium, that helium only has this much mass. And that missing mass is called the binding energy. And that's how much energy you get out when you squish those things together. So stars support their giant mass by doing fusion, squishing things together, and making energy come out. So, I mean, I don't think that really works with our Munchlax situation. Like, the amount of energy required to fuse nitrogen is not going to be held in our 105 kilogram little Munchlax boy. He doesn't have enough mass to do fusion. That's not going to work. What about nuclear fission? Like, where you break apart atomic nucleuses? Like, what if you found a bunch of sulfur in the Earth? and you broke it in half. Sulfur is element 16, so when you break the nucleus in half, you have one element 8 and another element 8. That's two oxygens right there. Now you just need four hydrogens and you can make water. But that's not really how nuclear fission works, right? You need a big boy, like uranium, and you pelt it with a neutron, and it breaks apart, releasing a bunch of energy releasing a bunch of neutrons that hit the other uraniums and they break apart and you get this runaway process and a huge huge explosion of energy but you didn't get any oxygens but there's a mass energy equivalence right like what if you took all those mevs and you only need one mev to make a proton so if you had eight mevs you could make eight protons and like get an oxygen going you need a water going it's fine <laughs> But again, I just don't think that Munchlax is walking around with a nuclear reactor strapped to his back. That's not really how it works. Like, he's just a little dude. Okay, so here's my idea instead. We have our atmosphere full of nitrogen. What if we just took that nitrogen, which is atomic number seven, and we just put a proton in it? You put a proton and a nitrogen, now you have an oxygen. And I'm sure we could find some hydrogen atoms somewhere to make a water. Let's just do that. I'm using this as an opportunity to talk about a very important physics paper, which is the ejection of protons from nitrogen nuclei, photographed by the Wilson method. Patrick Blackett. You've probably heard of Patrick Blackett. Patrick Blackett won the Nobel Prize in 1948 for using a cloud chamber to study cosmic rays. If you've heard of Blackett, you might have recently watched him in the Oppenheimer movie, uh, where Oppenheimer tries to poison him with an apple, a thing that definitely didn't happen and is somehow presented as true in that movie. If you're a YouTuber, who is also a physicist, so you avoided watching the Oppenheimer movie because like it seemed like homework and you didn't want to do it, you found out about Blackett and this story by reading the Wikipedia page. Because if you're going to make a YouTube video about someone, you have to read the Wikipedia page first to make sure there's nothing weird that people are going to yell at you for not mentioning. Don't read Isaac Asimov's Wikipedia page. <laughs> During his time at Cambridge, he became the supervisor of the young American graduate J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer's desire to study theoretical physics rather than focus on lab work brought him into conflict with Blackett. While seeking help for a psychiatric breakdown induced by the demanding Blackett, Oppenheimer admitted to trying to poison his tutor with an apple laced with toxins. Blackett did not eat the apple and no action was taken over the attempted poisoning. So I read that and I was like, well, that's not a true story. That doesn't make any sense. You can't admit to trying to poison someone and they're just like, it's fine. And then I was like, surely they didn't put this in the movie. Where did this story come from? 
And I learned that it is a story that is told in the book American Prometheus, which is a biography of Oppenheimer. What a clever title. I'm sure you were the first to do that. And in the book, they present it as a true story while saying it probably didn't happen like that. For example, let me read to you from this Vanity Fair article titled, Yes, Robert Oppenheimer really did poison his professor's apple. No, he didn't. You s okay, in the article, here's what they say. Like so many other unbelievable things in Oppenheimer, this really happened, though maybe not in a quite as cinematic fashion. So it didn't happen. Robert did something so stupid that it seemed calculated to prove that his emotional distress was overwhelming him, write the biographers uh, of American Prometheus. Consumed by his feelings of inadequacy and intense jealousy, he poisoned, poisoned in air quotes, <laughs> an apple with chemicals from the laboratory and left it on Blackett's desk. His friend Jeffries Wyman suggests in the book that Oppenheimer might have exaggerated the story somehow, and the biographers suggest that the poison might not have been cyanide, but something that would only make him sick. But in Wyman's words, whatever it was, it was an act of jealousy, much less harmful, but somehow Cambridge officials found out about it and Oppenheimer's influential parents had to intervene to keep him from being expelled. So they say it's probably not true. His friends say that it's not a true story. It's an exaggeration by Oppenheimer. And I'm sorry, his influential parents from the textiles industry intervened with Cambridge, one of the oldest institutions in the world, to be like, sorry, he tried to kill the, the famous physicist who's gonna win a Nobel Prize at, at your university, sorry about that. No, you can't attempt to kill someone, admit it, and there's, there's no record of it. Oppenheimer's family have been speaking out against the story since that biography came out. You can see all these interviews with his grandson where he's like, I'm a little upset that was in the film, that never happened. But I think the reason I wanted to clock it as not true right away is because there is a long-standing tradition of physics graduate students exaggerating like the difficulty, the stress level, the working conditions of graduate school. Like we're not coal miners. Like we read books and solve problems all day. It can be stressful, but it's really hard to explain unless you've been through it. But the way, the way every single graduate student acts like they're running an Iron Man, it, it, I've talked about this in my graduate student video, which has really bad audio. Maybe I should re-record it. But I do think the fact that they still do this is evidence that it's been happening forever. Because I've talked about how people who have parents that are professors go to graduate school and they just act like it's like the most intense thing because they're trying to live up to the stories their parents have told. It's a whole thing, but overall it hurts first generation grad students. It hurts uh, international grad students because it allows some professors to be abusive and people think that that's expected and it's bad. I wish we could all stop lying about this, but I bet what happened is Oppenheimer was pissed that his boss was making him do experiments when he didn't want to and he was looking at an apple and he's like, I could kill that guy. And then he told, like, he told this story later as like, I could have killed him too. It was a thing I wanted to do 20 years ago. But I mean, don't take my word for it. Why don't we look at the Cambridge Library special collection? Because if anyone's going to know, it's going to be the librarians who have all of Oppenheimer's records and have no account of any disciplinary actions. They have no account of a letter from a psychiatrist who would have had to report this man is trying to kill another man. It didn't happen. It just didn't happen. There's been a lot of talk recently on the YouTube about how important truth is and you shouldn't just repeat fake stories. This is a fake story. This didn't happen. I get that like narratively, you're writing a biography of Oppenheimer and you're like, wouldn't it be interesting if this man who grappled with having to make a bomb that could destruct a lot of things also grappled with that 20 years earlier in graduate school as like a micro version of a future thing he had to deal with. What an interesting narrative, but like, that's not real life. It's bad to fake things like that. And it's bad to be like, well, it definitely happened, but maybe not like that. Maybe it didn't happen. Like you can't say it happened in the title and then in the text of the article be like, well, it didn't really happen. <sighs> anyway. 
So, Blackett's paper. This is the first record of transmutation of an element. What Blackett has set up is something emitting alpha particles. An alpha particle is like a helium nucleus, two neutrons, two protons, and he's slamming it into nitrogen. And he records the production of oxygen. So what you have is nitrogen plus an alpha particle yielding fluorine, which immediately disintegrates, that's the word they use, into oxygen 17 plus a proton. Lucky for us, oxygen 17 is a stable version of oxygen. There's not a lot of it in the atmosphere, but if it's made, it's stable. They didn't know that at the time of this paper, which is another interesting thing. He was just like, it looks like it's probably oxygen. And later it was discovered from spectra that oxygen 17 is a thing. But isn't that neat? Now we have a proton too. So we have, we've made an oxygen, we've made a proton. Just do that twice. You'll have two oxygens, two protons. You have one water and a leftover oxygen. We can use this. Uh, I wanna show you the images. They did this with cloud chambers. Here's a gif of thorite, which is a radioactive material inside a cloud chamber. It just puts off these tracks where you can track like the direction of a particle. If you slap a magnetic field on this, the charged particles will start curling. You can measure the mass by the radius of, of the curl of the track. Uh, but what he was able to do looks like this. He saw that the alpha particle slammed into the nucleus of the nitrogen and stayed there. It didn't escape. And on that impact, it kicked out a proton. So you have effectively made an oxygen. I like to read the Nobel Prize speeches, like sometimes they're weird, crazy rants, but a lot of times in physics, they'll do like just a really nice review of their work. Blackett's is really nice. He talks about uh, the, the cloud chamber to measure cosmic rays. He talks about this work and kind of the work that everyone did to build up to that, like who, who made the cloud chamber he worked with, who, who built the camera, because it's so hard to take pictures. <laughs> because you have to document the track. So you have to have a camera that works fast enough to take images fast enough, all of that good stuff. And I just wanna read you the end line, just because we've talked about this recently. Although a careful search has been made, no case of a negative proton has yet been found. So this is 1948. Just wait, wait, we'll make, we'll make the anti-protons. Just wait, it's fine. <laughs> I don't want to lead you astray here. I feel like there's quite a few people who've mentioned they're in graduate school right now. So I used the word transmutation because that is what Blackett used. I have never heard a physicist say that. It sounds very old timey. It sounds very alchemy, right? Like, oh, we transmutated the iron into gold. I'm Isaac Newton. You know, no, no one says that. You would call it like the synthesis of oxygen from nitrogen bombarded with alpha particles or something. Uh, transmutation is fun, but I've never heard a physicist say it. So don't go around saying it. I don't think people talk like that anymore. <laughs> but now we have a formula. Okay, we have a bunch of nitrogen in the atmosphere. We just got to get some alpha particles and shoot them out into the atmosphere to, to make oxygen and you'd have to do it twice right because you need two protons to two hydrogen atoms h2o so you just shoot out a bunch of alpha particles enough to turn enough of the nitrogen into enough of the oxygen and protons to make water and then once the water is there i feel like it'll just fall onto our munchlax we just need 355 kilograms of water to fall onto our munchlax and turn it into a snorlax so what we need is for munchlax to have a source of alpha particles inside his little body. Okay. I didn't really want to go the fission route because like you need a fast neutron source. You need to store all of that energy and somehow turn it into oxygen, which seems very complicated. But, but maybe you could just like, what if you looked at your little munchlax and he just had a big chunk of thorium inside his body. Like he's 105 kilograms. What if like 30 kilograms of munchlax with thorium? Specifically, I want a big chunk of thorium-228 inside munchlax. Thorium-228 has a half-life of less than two years. 
Pokemon can live two years before they evolve. That's fine, right? It, it can't be Thorium-232 because that is a radioactive nucleus, but it has like a half-life of the age of the universe. That doesn't work for our Pokemon. So we have to start with Thorium-228. And the thing about Thorium-228 is that its decay chain is just chock full of alpha particles. It's an alpha emitter. It's it's actually what Bla Blackett used as his, as his alpha particle source. Um, and also... <laughs> Yeah, that, that gif I showed you was thorite, which is a combination of uranium and thorium. Um, so yeah, we're going to have thorium-228 inside of our munchlax. And let's just imagine that Pokemon have evolved real evolution to, to have somehow control the radiation so that statistically, even though it's likely to be radiating alpha particles all the time, it all happens all at once. All at once, this big chunk of thorium inside Munchlax is gonna do its decay chain and just throw a bunch of alpha particles into the atmosphere. And then we have alpha particle plus nitrogen so we can make some oxygen. Let us calculate how big that chunk of thorium would have to be. So we're going the route of nuclear radiation as our energy source, and that's fine. That could work, we got this. So first we need to calculate how many alpha particles we need. We know that Munchlax is gonna go from 105 kilograms to 460 kilograms, so we can calculate how many alphas. The difference in that mass is 355 kilograms. We know oxygen is 18 grams per mole, and we know we need to do this twice because we need two protons, because water is H2O. You need two hydrogens for every one oxygen. So we can calculate that we need 2 times 10 to the 28 alpha particles. That's doable, right? That's fine. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of mass of thorium? So we know every thorium nucleus is going to do its decay chain and release 5 alpha particles before it turns into lead, right? That's what's happening in this diagram. Like you follow this decay chain, it's releasing alpha particles. You also see some beta particles. Those are electrons and positrons and that's actually really handy because we're going to take an alpha particle and put it into a nitrogen and it's going to kick a proton out but we need another electron to make this like a neutral little water molecule right so those beta particles are going to come in handy and there's also a lot of gamma rays coming off that's the bright flash you see when pokemon evolve all the gamma rays coming off of this would be very bright like you your eyes can't actually see gamma rays but you you would see you would see the event um and then you would never see again but let's ignore that part for now okay so we need 2 times 10 to the 20 alpha particles we know that each thorium is going to give us five alpha then we know how many ends are in a mole and we know how many grams of thorium are in a mole of thorium and what we get is the mass of the thorium that would be required to make this number of alpha particles so we could use the nitrogen in the atmosphere to get the water to turn munchlax into snorlax out of Munchlax is 105 kilograms. We only need 9,120 of those kilograms to be thorium. It doesn't really work. We need like a lot of thorium. <laughs> you need a lot of thorium to get that many alpha particles. Plus, thorium decays and releases these gammas, it releases the betas, it releases the alphas, but then it just turns into lead, right? our nice little stable boy lead. So in addition, if you just happen to have the 9,000 whatever kilograms of thorium, you would be left with like 8,700 kilograms of lead. So your Snorlax would be a lot bigger than 460 kilograms. It just, it doesn't make sense. Pokemon evolution doesn't make sense. It doesn't scratch out. Oh, I should also mention Blackett's reaction, this, where I was like, oh, we could just take the nitrogen and turn it into oxygen, it's actually a really rare event. <laughs> it's actually a really small cross-section for this to happen. Um, he saw it eight times out of 400,000 images. Well, no, he saw it eight times out of 400,000 tracks in his cloud chamber. So you have to multiply or like nearly 10,000 kilograms of thorium by 400,000 divided by eight. So... It's not going to work.
this video was not sponsored by Mega Blocks. I just thought I should review these toys in case you were thinking of buying them. I know that this is the kind of thing someone would buy and they would stick on their shelf. Not me, but like I know there are people that are really into Pokemon. And I just want to say like I know you're going to buy this anyway, but it, it kind of sucks. Mega Blocks are like not good. This hurt my hands to build. It was hard to press them together. And I don't understand because Lego exists. Lego has has optimized this product. It's it's better with Lego. So why 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 is it with this? Like this is it's okay. Like this is cute. It's poseable. You can like make it sit. And these are fun, but also like if you play with them, they fall apart, which I feel like Legos wouldn't do. So like I guess these are designed to just be made and then sat on a shelf. Um this was not sponsored by Mega Blocks. But I, I would like Lego to sponsor me because <laughs> I, I have fun building Legos. These were not, not the best. And they're very cute though. And I know like someone who wants these is, is going to buy them anyway, right? Um, they're very cute. So 